Welcome to our Sunday evening streaming service of the Double Springs Church of Christ. We're grateful for your presence this way. Let me also remind you that we will be doing this on Wednesday night for at least the next two or three weeks, uh, Wednesday night at 7. A few announcements that concern members of the congregation here. We continue to remember the family of Mrs. Nola Cockrell. This would be Jeff Martin's mother. Her funeral was on Friday. And remember the four grandchildren. On our sick list, we have some, uh, several now with COVID, some new cases, maybe some that I do not even know of. But especially at this time, we're remembering Greg and Kim Rooks. Greg is in the hospital at Coleman. He is on the ventilator. Uh, he is showing positive signs of improving, and uh, the ventilator has been cut down from 100% to about 60. And uh, let's continue to remember him. Kim is at home but she has been affected by the virus quite uh, extensively too, but not as much as Greg. But please remember them in your prayers. Mark Posey is home from the hospital at Winfield. Uh, Polly also has it at home. Uh, Glenda's uh, mother-in-law, Tim's uh, mother, Wanda Hodge, is now uh, quarantined uh, at a facility for 14 days before she will be uh, then put back into the nursing home. Let's continue to remember Kenneth Whittemore. He had uh, two treatments this last week, and uh, he will have treatments again uh, three weeks from this week. Please continue to remember Rob Ray, uh, Rob and his struggle with uh, cancer, and let's not forget him. Also, Elaine uh, Garrison had surgery this last week. She will have surgery again next uh, week on her eye, and uh, Clyde has some tests coming up this week. Tisha Horsley had a arteriogram, and that's turned out good, and for that we're thankful. Uh, Brother Jerry Rutland continues to struggle with his shingles. He's just not had a good week. We hope this week will be better. Ms. Geraldine Wilson, I talked to the daughter-in-law today and visited there this afternoon, but as of the time this is recorded, uh, she is very critical at home, but still with us. Willa Dean Terrell is at uh, Erlene's house, and she's recovering from surgery. Janie Baldy continues to recover from bronchitis. Continue to remember Brother Ted Rayleigh. Uh, he is improving. Shannon Dempsey is improving. Uh, Bean Green, let's continue to remember him. Marjolyn Parker and Catherine Cole. Others that are affected by COVID, Sister Lois Nelson continues to improve. Tommy Gentle, uh, Ernie, Missy, and Cooper are improving. Bart Shannon is improving. Tim and Kathy got a negative this week. And uh, Karen and the new Tim have been there today. Uh, also, uh, the Coles, uh, we want to continue to remember them, and they should be out of quarantine, I think, after today. Uh, uh, this is Jeff and Diana. Uh, Kevin and Susan Thomas continue to recover as well, and a new one we just learned of today, uh, Brother Tommy Edwards has COVID, and we sure hope that they can keep Sister Shelby from uh, contacting that. Those on our shut-in list are Freddie Pohl, uh, Burt Jones, Roberta Garrison, the Cavenders, Louise House, Frankie Height, uh, Miss Evelyn Hicks, uh, David Thomaston, mother, and uh, also I've uh, heard that Denny Tench, his father, had a very serious stroke, and uh, they're all in Georgia with him, including uh, Mary Lou Hamby. But thank you for being with us, our order of service. Uh, we will have a, an opening uh, prayer after uh, two songs and Greg McCuller will lead that prayer then after another song with Justin Guin will be our speaker and that will follow by one verse of an invitation song and then a closing prayer so at this time let's worship together
bow as we pray. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be your great name. We're thankful, Father, that you are our almighty God. We're thankful, Father, you love us so much that you sent your only begotten Son, Jesus, to this earth as a man. We're thankful that he had the ability to overcome the temptations of the devil and to live a sinless life in the flesh. We're thankful that he was willing to bear our sin in his body. Our Lord took on our sin and became sin for us. He suffered and sacrificed his life. He died in our place because of our sin. The cross of Calvary. He shed his precious blood, blood of the new covenant that gives us opportunity for the forgiveness of our sin. We're thankful, Father, that through his blood we might be made righteous in your eyes, have a hope of heaven. We're thankful for your mercy, thankful for the gift of grace. We're thankful, Father, that in you we have peace in our lives. We're thankful that you're patient with us. We don't deserve the unmerited favor you've given us. Not a single one of us worthy. We all fall short, do things disappoint you we say things that disappoint you we think things that disappoint you father we're sorry when we fail you we humbly bow to you in prayer and ask you to forgive us we need you father we ask you to help us to be better christians to be more like jesus help us keep self out of the way it's one of the hardest things we'll do is to keep self out of the way we ask you father to help us to not be selfish or prideful Help us not be envious or greedy. Help us to not be bitter or get angry. We're thankful, Father, that you are love. You love us because we first, we love you because you first loved us. And, Father, we show our love for you by obeying your word. You command us to love you with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. Command us to love our neighbor in the same way you love us. You command us to even love our enemies. Pray your blessings upon them. It's a tall order. It's hard to do, Father. Sometimes we don't want to do it. That's why we need you, Father. We're so thankful you're there for us. We're thankful that you've promised us you'll never leave us, you'll never forsake us. Father, we praise you. Give you all the glory and honor for your awesome power. We have many that have been mentioned, Father, that are battling sickness, disease, out in this COVID virus. We pray, Father, for the doctors and nurses that are treating them, Father, that are tending to them. We pray that you give them the ability to use their wisdom and their education to make right diagnosis, prescribe right medicines and treatments, Father, to help them get well. We also pray, Father, for those that have lost loved ones. We have some, Father, that are so dear and close to us that are grieving, Father. We grieve with them. We weep with them, Father. We ask you to give them strength and comfort them as only you can. We pray, Father, as we study your word, as we hear the message brought to us, that we would gain wisdom and knowledge and a better understanding of your will for our lives. We pray for strength, Father. Help us be strong when we face temptation. We pray for guidance. We pray, Father, that we might humble ourselves and allow you to guide our steps. We pray for our country, Father. Pray for our leaders. There's much going on, but we know that you're in control, Father. We're grateful for that. We pray for those that are risking their lives, fighting for our freedoms, Father. We pray for the law enforcement and the courts and the judges and All those that are in authority, Father, help us to to allow them, Father, to do the things necessary. We pray that they look to you for answers and guidance. We're thankful, Father, for this opportunity to pray to you. We pray that you hear our prayer, Father, and we're humbled and thankful that we have this opportunity. Thank you for all you've done and given us, most of all, what you have in store for us. Pray these prayers in the precious name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.
in our worship service. We appreciate the opportunity to come to you by means of technology. We appreciate all those who helped make this possible and so that we can continue to worship together uh, in the midst of this uh, pandemic. It uh, seems many, now many months we've been doing this and we just we owe a great debt of gratitude to, to, to Mark, Jeremy, Don, and to Tim Hodge and others that are upstairs and helping with this. And we just want to, to show our appreciation just a minute of what they do to help us with this. And it's not what we want to do on Sunday nights to worship together, but it is a, a great opportunity for us. If you have your Bible, be turning to the book of First, uh, 2 Timothy. We're going to be in chapter 2 and verse 1 as we think about God's greatest gift to man. What is the best gift that you have purchased this year for Christmas. And you may have a gift for your spouse or maybe for your child or your grandchild or grandchildren. You know it's something they really, really want. And maybe it's not something that's incredibly expensive, uh, but you know that's something they're really, really passionate about and a hobby or maybe it's something they're into and you're excited about it and you can't wait to see their face now, that's way better than, to me, than giving a gift is to see the face of somebody when you surprise them with something they're not expecting or you know they really want that. It seems like the last few weeks I get a, a daily text message from my mother. Uh, what do you think Blake or Ben or Afton would like this? And then I've learned she's not always asking for herself. She's asking for aunts and uncles that have asked her, what do the grandkids want? And so she's excited about Christmas morning and, and having an opportunity to, to sit down and open that gift. You know, this year there are many things uh, that are on the top ten list for, for kids and for people. And a lot of those things cost a lot of money. We like giving gifts. We like receiving gifts. We're going to talk more about that in just a little bit. But the greatest gift ever given to man is salvation through Jesus Christ. And when we think about salvation through Jesus Christ... Uh, there are many aspects of God's character that come to the forefront. Uh, Greg mentioned so ably in his prayer. What a beautiful prayer that was. And I, I thought it fit well with our lesson this evening about God's grace. We think about God's grace and God's mercy. That's kind of two sides of the same coin. God's grace is that unmerited favor that Greg talked about in that prayer. And then mercy is, you know, not getting what we deserve. And so tonight we're going to take just a minute to think about the gift of God's grace in my estimation, we can't have too many lessons on God's grace. To think about that, as the hymn says, something that's amazing, something that we cherish, something that without it we have no hope. And so as we think about this together, we're going to notice five aspects of God's grace. And so as we get to a definition of what God's grace is, God's grace is his favor which brings salvation and strength. An illustration of this comes in Genesis chapter 6 where it says that Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. That's chapter 6 and verse 8. 
where the Lord was going to bring destruction upon the world because of the sins of humanity. And God gave a way of escape to Noah, his family, and any of those who would listen to his preaching. The Bible describes Noah as a herald of righteousness in 2 Peter. So Noah not only was building, he was preaching, saying, you know, this boat is the gospel, if you will. If you want to escape impending doom, here is how you do it. And by God's grace, a way of salvation was made for humanity. And as we know the story from the Old Testament, only eight people took advantage of that particular uh, way out of, for salvation. So for us, when we think about God's grace, there are several passages which come to mind. One of the most well-known is Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. If you have to earn something, that thereby logically lets us know it's not a gift. You know, there are some gifts that continue giving, and not in a good way. Have you ever had that happen? I remember once somebody gave me a, a gift card to a restaurant for, it wasn't really a gift, it was for something we had done, a promotional type thing. And when I got there, the gift card would only cover about half the meal. That was the most expensive free meal supposedly I'd ever been given. And so some gifts don't do that. So something is the result of works. And you can look at God and say, I didn't need your grace. I can boast about this. I didn't need you. I was able to do this on my own. And the Bible makes it very clear here that God's grace and God's unmerited favor lets us know that God does for us what we cannot do for ourselves. And another aspect of God's grace is what it does for us on a daily basis, and that strengthens us. If you turn over to the last epistle of the Apostle Paul, he spends chapter 1 encouraging his young apprentice to continue preaching. You guard that deposit not only today, but until the day, the judgment day, you guard that deposit which has been entrusted to you, and you follow the pattern of sound words. In other words, if I could summarize chapter 1, be faithful to your God-given task. And then it begins chapter 2 by saying this, You then, my child, be strengthened by the grace that is in Christ Jesus. You think about God's grace being preparatory. It prepares us. Uh, to live this life, the strength to know that God is doing for me what I cannot do for myself. Now, that does not mean I'm passive. I'm, of course, we're active. God expects obedience. And, but we're going to notice in our lesson uh, this evening different ways that God's grace strengthens us to live for him each day. Number one, as we think about God's grace strengthening us, we grow in God's grace. Let's turn to the epistle of 2 Peter. This particular letter is bookended by exhortations to grow. And let's notice first 2 Peter chapter 1. And notice as he begins talking to, I believe, the same church as he talked to in the first letter, although they're not mentioned here, he says this beginning in verse 5. For this very reason, make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue and virtue with knowledge, and knowledge with self-control, and self-control with steadfastness, and steadfastness with godliness, and godliness with brotherly affection, and brotherly affection with love. So we have all these different qualities that increases our faith and increases our ability to live the Christian life. And he ends this letter by saying this. We often call these the Christian graces, well, it's not mentioned specifically here in chapter 1, but we get to chapter 3 and verse 18, and it says, But grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. You think about growing in God's grace and what that provides uh, for each of us. Grace transforms us. Growing in our relationship with the Lord enables us to be fruitful. Let's go back to chapter 1. And I want you to notice two passages here in verses 8 and 9. It says this, for if these qualities are yours and are increasing. Now, this is a daily thing. This isn't something you do once. You don't say, well, okay, well, I've added virtue. Okay, next. If I'm, I'm stopped added virtue. I don't, I don't have to worry about that one anymore. Notice that present tense verb, and they are yours and are increasing, it says here in the English Standard Version. Let's continue reading. They keep you from being ineffective, unfruitful, 
in the knowledge of God and the Lord Jesus Christ. For whoever lacks these qualities is so nearsighted that he is blind, having forgotten that he was cleansed from our former sins. I, I'm nearsighted. Uh, if you have something that's here, I can see it pretty well. But the farther you get it away, the less clear it becomes. You know, the idea of being nearsighted is kind of being focused right here. And not being appreciative of what God has given me now, but also the future hope uh, that he provides for me. God expects you and me to grow in God's grace. So what does this mean for me today? Well, growing in God's grace draws us closer to God. And we begin asking the right questions for our life. So what are some of these questions, such as, God, what do you want from my life? Sometimes we spend too much time asking, what do I want out of my life? That's, for a Christian, that's the wrong question. The question is, what does God want with my life? What does he desire me to do? Psalm 37, in that passage, it talks about when we take our desires and make them God's desires, and that time will be blessed, Psalm 37 and verse 4. To me, that's the answer to the question, does God want me to be happy? Well, God wants you to delight in the things in which he delights. And in them, we'll know more than happiness. We'll know joy. Another thing that growing in God's grace does, growing in God's grace focuses on God's will for your life. Now, God's will is instructive. It's given to us in the form of the Bible. That's God's revealed will. Now, there are different talents and different incidentals where God has providentially opened doors and closed others in our life. But we're talking about God's revealed will, that, that will to which we are to be submissive, Matthew chapter 7 and verse 21 to 23. We start asking the question, what does God's word command me to do in the Lord? You know, we, I think we struggle with submission. I know we do. I think seeing things like, you know, the mask orders, and I hear people talk about those things, and, and, and there are varying opinions. I understand that. But, you know, when I think about it as an illustration of our just lack of sometimes wanting to submit to something, we struggle with that, don't we? But God expects us to submit. God expects us to be wholly, completely uh, focused on what he desires for our life. So if, if it's God's gift to man, this grace causes growth in my life. Number two, and we see here that growing in God's grace helps me understand my need for grace. You know, when you stand in need of, of something that you cannot provide for yourself, that is a very helpless situation. I don't know if you've ever been in that in that situation before, I'm sure most all of us have. Or when you look at a situation, maybe it's with our health or the health of our child, uh, and, and there's nothing you can do about it. I mean, that's helpless. I remember when Afton was uh, having seizures, uh, when she first started, we start, first started walking down this path towards her diagnosis. She had several dozens of grand mal seizures over the course of 72 hours. And there was nothing I could do. The doctor said, we have to watch it for 72 hours. And, and Afton would have a seizure, she would wake up, vomit, go seize again, go back to sleep. And it, that was just the cycle we went through for hours. And I remember watching that, and, there, and I knew she wasn't you know, life-threatening, it was going to be okay, and they would get to a solution, and they would find some medications, and she was going to be fine. But I really didn't want to hear that during those three days, I'll be honest with you. I was worried because I was helpless. I didn't know what I could do. I just wanted the solution. You know, we men, especially men, we want to fix it and fix it now. Well, in that situation, then I wanted to fix it and fix it now. And the doctor told me I had to be patient. When we stand in need of something we can't do for ourselves, that's helpless. You can't save yourself, as we noticed in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 9. And when we understand we stand in God's grace, and standing in God's grace meets our needs. Look at Romans chapter 5 and verse 2 with me uh, this evening. It says this, Through him we have obtained access by faith into his grace, in which we stand. We rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. So what does standing in grace provide? I want you to notice three blessings this brings to our life. Number one, access by faith. Let's go to Hebrews chapter 11. I want you to notice something that's said about 
the heroes of faith. Uh, our Sunday night class, we've been studying Hebrews chapter 11, and we just completed that study. And I can't say that I've meditated or thought through this last two verses of this chapter until I taught through it uh, this past quarter. And I want you to notice what it says about these Old Testament examples. It says this, And all these, that's all these examples that's been mentioned here, we call the Hall of Faith. And all of these, though commended through their faith, did not receive what is promised, since God had provided something better for us, that apart from us they should not be made perfect. I want you to think about the access that we have to God and salvation as a result of that new covenant. It says they didn't receive that promise. If you read the book of Hebrews, that promise refers to salvation that's found in Jesus Christ. So you think about all the people there that I don't feel worthy to compare myself to Abraham and Noah and Moses and all these people. And he says, we have something better. We have access to God. He says in chapter 9 that Jesus went beyond the veil and we have direct access to God, he being our high priest. We have that as a result of the blood of Jesus Christ. You know, we have access to the, to the creator, the most powerful being on the face of the earth. And he says we have access through faith to salvation and have a, a relationship with God the Father, being led by the Holy Spirit through his word and walking in the path that Jesus has blazed for us and being continually in fellowship with him, walking in the light as God is in the light and having that continual cleansing with the blood of Christ. That's access. That's what that means. You know, we like to know people who have access. You know, that's, it's always good to have a friend who can help you out sometimes. They have access. We have a high priest, Jesus Christ, who provides access to God the Father. What's the greatest access you can have? And we have it because we stand in grace. We also have a firm foundation. If we had the children here, we, we've not been able to meet with the children much this year. And, but th those things will come back and it'll get better. If you ask any child what happened to the foolish man's house that was built on the sand, he's going to tell you, well, it went splat. Well, what happened to the, the man who built it on the rock? Well, uh, he, his house stood firm. You know, we don't like being in a situation where you don't have good footing. I found that out yesterday. I was helping Blake do something, and, and uh, I found out pretty quick that, uh, that, uh, that what we were dealing with was a, basically a mudslide. I learned the hard way at the bottom of a ditch that I didn't have good footing. I don't like that. A firm foundation. Notice there he says, we stand. Think about the idea of the ability to stand before God and be able to stand before God with confidence, not because of my own goodness and not because of your own goodness, but because of the goodness that's a result of God's grace. A final thing we have rejoicing. First Peter chapter 1, verses 8 and 9 talks about a, a joy that's inexpressible and full of glory. We have a, that as a result of standing in God's grace. So we notice this second thing in understanding this gift of grace that God has given us. We stand in it. A third thing this evening, we learn in grace. Let's turn to Titus chapter 2. Let's look at verses 11 to 13 and notice how God's grace trains us to live for the Lord. Let's begin reading together. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions, and to live self-controlled upright and godly lives in the present age, waiting for our blessed hope and the appearing of the glory of the great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness, to purify him for himself a people for his own possession who are zealous for good works. We actually continued there through verse 14. But you notice that phrase, God's word, God's grace, trains us. It teaches us to live differently. Another passage in 2 Peter, uh, 2 Timothy rather, uh, chapter 3 and verse 16 and 17 says that's the result of God's word. So God's grace through God's word trains us so that we may be thoroughly furnished, adequate, equipped for every good work, verse 17 says of 2 Timothy chapter 3. But notice some things it trains us to do. Number one, it trains us to renounce ungodliness. I heard a few years ago in a prayer, and I've tried to include that, when I, especially when I pray publicly to, 
to think about that congregationally, to live our lives in view of God's grace and God's goodness. When I live my life through the lens, looking through it through the fact that God has given me grace, well, that's going to change the way I live. Think about somebody in your life that's been gracious to you. How do you treat that person? We treat them with love and kindness and respect, not because they've given you something, but because they've shown you love, and you reciprocate that with love yourself for them. And so for us, when we see ungodly, God says, stay away from those things. I I'm giving you grace, but can we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid, the Bible says in Romans chapter 6 and verse 1. But also that as a result of that, to live with self-control, to wait with anticipation the coming of our Lord. And waiting for anticipation isn't just sit around looking at the sky. As you know, it's serving the Lord each day, living self-control, godliness. Why? But at verse 14 says, God has prepared us for good works. That's similar to what you find in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 10. We are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which he prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. We learn in grace the type people that God desires us to be. It goes back to growing in grace. That first thing we talked about, we said, what type of person does God want us to be? When we understand that we have God's grace, we learn what type of person God wants us to be. Number four, as we think about this, sufficiency in grace. Let us never doubt God's grace. It's powerful. It's something that we rely on each day. In 2 Corinthians chapter 12, Paul was given what he identifies as a thorn in the flesh. And one thing we learn from this passage is that how do we deal with the things in life that are not going to change? There are some things in our life, it may be health, it may be relational, it may be, you name it. Those things are not going to change. How do we deal with those things? The Bible says here we deal with it through God's grace. Let's begin reading here in verse 7 and 8 and notice what Paul says concerning this thorn in the flesh. So as to keep me from being conceited because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, a thorn was given uh, to me in the flesh, a messenger from Satan to harass me, to keep me from being conceited. Three times I pleaded with the Lord about this, that he should leave me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. For my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weakness, so that in the power of Christ may rest upon me. For the sake of Christ, then, I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Let's focus on that last phrase there. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Usually it's when those weak moments that Paul's talking about right here, when we see God's grace and God's strength the most. So how do I deal with those things that, that are not going to change in my life? Well, I deal with them through the grace and the strength that he provides because he perfectly meets our needs. Number five, we have appreciation for God's grace. A minute ago, I asked, what's the best gift you've purchased this year? Well, let me ask you this. What's the best gift you've been given? Is there a gift that you think about, and it may not even be something that's worth a whole lot of money, but somebody gave you that and you thought, I have a great appreciation for that. What would that be in your life? How much appreciation did you show to that person? Oh, thank you. And, you. and you may even continually thank them for that because it may be something you're continuing to use or something that might have a lot of meaning to you. And every so often you just say, man, I just appreciate you giving me that. Well, what about God's grace? In 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 14 and 15, Paul says this. He says, concerning the gift, the 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 uh, Corinthians had been talking about, he'd been talking about their generosity and things, and he says, while they long for you and pray for you because of the surpassing grace of God is upon you, thanks be to God for this inexpressible gift. The, the phrase inexpressible gift, there's a lot of suggestions as to which that refers to salvation. I think in context, you can say the surpassing grace may be what that refers to. And the word inexpressible here, or in some versions of the Bible, it says indescribable. It means this in the Greek New Testament. It says that which cannot be related or communicated. 
Have you ever had something that was given to you or it was so magnificent that you saw it that you couldn't begin to describe it? You say, well, I'm not smart enough or eloquent enough to describe really what I saw or what I've received or whatever that situation may be. That's kind of the idea behind this gift of God's grace. And it reminds us of who we are, who we were, and what we are today. Let's go to Ephesians chapter 2, and I want you to notice the first four verses of that chapter. We've looked at verses 8 and 9. Now let's read uh, verses uh, 1 through 4 of that chapter and see what precedes this discussion uh, concerning God's grace. Let's read together. Begin with me in verse 1. And you were dead in trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, which were by nature children of wrath, like the rest of mankind. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. You see in that passage, you see who you were and who you are now. And you see, verse 10, what you hope to do and what you hope to become. God's grace. A couple of passages we began looking at here for our study. That unmerited favor, that, that which provides salvation. Ephesians 2 verses 8 and 9, and that which provides strength. Do you need God's grace? Of course you do. Are you a Christian? You know, this measure of grace is only for those who are in Christ Jesus. Maybe you'd like to become a Christian today. There'll be no greater gift that you could give yourself at Christmas than to do God's will and obey his word. I remember a couple of years ago, we had a Sunday. It was Christmas 2011. And on that Sunday, Christmas 2011, three people obeyed the gospel. I'll never forget that. And uh, they're Christians today, faithful Christians today. We're thankful for them. And would you like to be part of the redeemed, zealous for good works, Titus chapter 2 and verse 14. Or maybe you've got some of the struggles of life, and it may be something you've been studying about, praying about, and you would like to pray us to the church. Now contact Vance, me, the elders, whoever, a brother, brother, sister in Christ. I'd like for you to pray with me. I'd like to have forgiveness of those sins. The Lord's invitation is always open. And it's always extended. It's not just at a time at the end of our lessons. And if you need to contact one, someone on, on, uh, on your behalf, please do so. And don't delay any longer. We're going to sing a song for us to reflect upon those things. And if you have need, please contact one of us. When we walk in so thankful for today. We're so grateful, Father, for all of your goodness toward us. As we began this last complete week of this year, we know it's been a unique year, but Father, we know you've been good through it. Thank you for the lesson we've heard. We're so grateful, Father, for your grace extended to us. We know we're not worthy. We've not earned it or deserve it, but thank you for it. May it influence our lives as we've been taught in this lesson. And may our lives be more like your son every single day. Bless us as we depart. We thank you, Father, for the hope of heaven. Bless all of ours that are suffering, those that are grieving. We thank you so much for the help that you provide through your grace. In your son's name we pray. Amen.